Okay, guys, we are here today on our seventh episode of BGJ Fanatics podcast, and we have here as a guest today the King Gordon Ryan. What's up, and, guys? <laughs> and also Michael, too, my business partner of BGJ Fanatics. So, guys, super excited to have Gordon here. Gordon is probably like the, the guy who everybody's talking about in Jiu Jitsu right now, right? He, he just won the World No Gi double gold, his division in the open class. He won the ADCC on his division. He got second in the open class. And all of this with 23 years old. Yeah. 23 years old. So super, super impressive, guys. And uh, in my opinion, what's even more impressive is that he always says that he's going to win. And even the words no gi, he was <laughs> walking around with the crown. And uh, he goes there and he actually does it. So that that's amazing, in my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> But uh, thanks so much for being here, Gordon. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, so Gordon, let's start talking here first about the Worlds No Gi. So, uh, so you know, Worlds uh, No Gi Worlds was definitely uh, was definitely fun. Um, you know, there was a lot of hype going into it when I uh, when I signed up and Flow Grappling got a hold of it, and they were like, Gordon's competing at No Gi Worlds, um, and then it turned out to be the biggest No Gi Worlds ever. Um, like my division pretty much could have been an, an ADCC division. There was. Uh, Myself, there was Tex Johnson who just won uh, the ADCC trials all by submissions. Satoshi Ishii, who's a black belt in Jiu Jitsu and the Olympic gold medalist in Judo. Um, Jared Dopp, ADCC silver medalist. Yuri, two time ADCC champion. And Cyborg, like multiple time black belt world champion and uh, an ADCC champion. So it was like pretty much an ADCC division um, for Nogi Worlds. And that's the most stacked, the ultra heavyweight division has been. I think, oh, and Muhammad Ali, who's the current uh, world champion for in the gi right now. Um, so that's pretty much the most stacked division uh, for ultra heavyweight in no gi worlds, I think, ever. So it was definitely, definitely exciting going in and getting to compete in that and then doing the absolute as well. Cool. So I think like the first question that everybody has in mind, especially when they see like you walk with the crowd is that what goes on your mind like one day before the tournament because for you to do that you gotta you gotta be very confident that you're gonna win yeah right? it's, so. it's actually pretty funny like the closer we get to the competition like the more confident i get so like the, the closer we get like the more shit i talk so like uh, it's like a week out and then I'm start, <laughs> i start posting shit and i start making like instagram stories and i'm like all right i'm ready to go like that's, that's how i like amp myself up so like two days before tournament i'm like talking shit to everybody then And like the day before the tournament, I come in with the crown and the robe on. And uh, I don't know, it just excites me. It just gets me in the zone and gets me ready to go. So like the closer we get, the more confident I get. And then, uh, of course, it's anxiety and things like that. But uh, but I always get, I'm always more confident the closer we are to the tournament. Okay, so so that, that's kind of cool. Like th this is something kind of like to, that turns you on as well, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It's definitely exciting for me. It's like I enjoy the whole process. Like some people like go out and they, they can peak because they have to or they, they don't like competing very much. Like I actually enjoy it. Like I like the crowd. I like the camera. I like the people coming up taking, asking to take pictures with me. So the whole thing for me is just fun. So I'm just enjoying every minute of it. I got it. What is it about that allows you to have that confidence? Because I think that so many of the listeners, so many of us have competed. And I know right before I compete, I competed at Master Worlds this year, and I remember thinking to myself, why the hell do I do this? And it was, it was, it was right before. And I certainly wasn't walking around the venue with a, with a crown and, um, and a robe on. I mean, what is it, what's different about you that allows you to, to be so confident? Uh, I mean, so part of it is I was literally, I think, just born like this, like we were talking about in the car. Um, like, I watched my first UFC fight when I was seven or eight years old. A and, daycare, uh, right? No, it wasn't a daycare. It was actually at my house. So my okay. daycare teacher would teach us moves, like, from the <laughs> UFC and make us fight each other. That's a whole other story, though. <laughs> But, like, uh, the, first, the first fight I saw was uh, Hoist Gracie versus Keith Hackney. It was, like, a Hoist Gra Gracie tribute where they were doing, like— uh, like a rerun of like all the first yeah. UFCs. Uh -huh. So I watched it when I was like eight years old and I just thought to myself, I'm like, that's what I'm gonna do when I get older. Like that's what I'm gonna do when I grow up. And I never really had a plan or anything until I actually started training. But like, I was just always like that. I always just thought that I was like the greatest. I was like, even before I trained jujitsu, I thought I was like the best at jujitsu ever. Um, Cause I would like beat up all my friends <laughs> at daycare. Uh, But uh, so you know, part of it is just that I was just, I'm just naturally confident I think. Uh, and the other part of it is obviously that I believe that I truly believe that I train with the best instructor in the world and then I train with the best team in the world um, and the most dangerous people in the world. I think that uh, for me going out, like the fear of losing by like a couple points or by advantages isn't really 
that big of a deal. But everyone who goes out to fight anyone from our team is like, oh man, like I can go out and get my leg broken, I can go out and get submitted. Um, so I think it's much more, uh, you know, mentally taxing for other people to come out and fight us versus us going out to fight them. Uh, yeah, man, that, 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 that was a very cool way to explain. Like, and uh, this brought me up on a story about uh, Jose Mar Pagliaris, the Tokinho, yes. in one day DCC. Uh, someone told me that uh, he was walking around in the warm up, this and that. And every other, the guy said that he never saw this in any grappling tournament. Like, everybody was walking around, all the fighters scared. They were like, man, you, you, it's normal to see that happening on an MMA match or something like that, but not in a grappling match, you know, because normally in a grappling match, like, even if you fight against the best guy in the world, like, against Roger Grace, you don't feel that scary because the maximum that can happen is he got them on and choke you, right? And they, when they were about to fight uh, Jose Mar Pagliaris, okay, everybody was scared. Yep, and that's yep. probably, like, the same thing yeah, that they're, they're having. getting legs broken. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they, it's, it's, it's natural. No, <laughs> and, uh, I agree, you know, because w- when I was competing, for example... I would not get scared to get choked, right? But man, being six months out, do a surgery, ligament, yeah, this and that. It's, this, it's, this, it's scary. Like when we go against scary. people from our team and you think like, I could really like get seriously injured doing this. It's just like, okay, like I have to take this seriously. You can't just go out and you can't just not train for it and not be prepared. Like you have to take it seriously. Like you yeah, can get like really injured competing against people from our team. I agree. And Gordon, I pretty much watched all your matches in the words no gi. And man, you were pulling guard everyone. You were sweeping, kind of going to the heel hook, but but there was heel hook was not allowed. You were using that to get a sweep, and man, when you were getting on top, it was so much pressure like that. And, yeah, yeah. I've and, been. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, and so you would mix like losing passes with tied passes with submission passes, and this is exactly what you showed today, guys. Today, Gordon shot an entire structure all about guard passing that you're gonna launch probably in February or March at bggfanatics.com. So, can you explain a little more about your system passing guards and is that? Yeah, so I talk about it a lot in the video, um, and really, what we have to think about is. First, we have to distinguish what kinds of guard passing there are, okay? If you look at all, historically, all the guard passers, they either do uh, loose passing, like, uh, for example, Leandro Lowe or the Hoff, or Hoffa Mendez, they throw their legs to the side and they use motion with the feet to get past their partner's legs. There's tight passing. If you look at Bernardo made a whole career off of, uh, of under-over passing or over-under passing, however you want, guys want to say it, um, of, with tight passing. Hodger Gracie is very good at, at tight passing, um, where you actually put wedges around your partner's hips, torso, and head and arm to pin their shoulders to the floor and then pass them. And then there's a third way of using submissions to get past your partner's legs, okay? They start sitting up into you to get an underhook, you go for a guillotine, you use the thread of the submission to get past their legs, or you use a kimor to get past their legs. Um, so I talk about all the three different kinds of passing and how to interchange them with one another, okay? If you look historically at, at all the best guard passers, most of them are specialists at, uh, at, at one kind of guard passing, and then they're good at the others, okay? But well, what I want you guys to be able to do and what I'm trying to do, it's still obviously a work in progress, is to master all three kinds of guard passing and be able to chain them all together effectively at the right point, uh, right point in time. So that's what, that's what the goal is, at least. So you want to talk about... W- I mean, we talked a little bit in the car. You you said to me that you thought you were really an average passer up through brown belts. You you favored pulling guard and going for leg locks and that kind of thing. What is it that that got you uh, that got you so interested in passing? Got you so good at passing? Um, well, so the first thing is John always was just trying to exploit the weakness of the sport, which at the time in nogi grappling was leg locks. So he's wa- always wanted to get as good at leg locks first. So the, my first thing that I started get, to get good at were leg locks. I wasn't trying to do really anything besides that because that's what was John was stressing the most, was get good at leg locks so you can have early success. Um, so for a while, it was really just me working on submissions. And then there was two points in my career where I really uh, became serious about guard passing. One was when John told me that he used leg pommeling to get past the guard, but he didn't have a real systematized way of doing it, of using leg pommeling to pass the guard. And then it was our job over the next couple of years to systematize leg pommeling to get past your opponent's guard. So I really took that to heart, and I tried to uh, to systematize leg pommeling for passing. Um, and the second time where I really started taking my passing seriously was uh, was when John told us at AD, or before ADCC camp that the only thing that everybody else could possibly be better at than us uh, 
at was uh, guard retention and guard passing, the other athletes. That the only thing that these guys may have on you is guard retention and guard passing. And that made me so furious that he could even think that anybody else in the world was a better passer or had a better guard than me. And I was like, you know what? I was like, I was like F this guy. I'm like, I'm going to show John for this ADCC camp that I'm the best guard passer in the world. So I like really focused on getting good at guard passing. For so like, it's like, ADCC when was camp. that? That was like before the ADCC camp because he like told us, he's like, he's like, the only place these guys are going to beat you is with guard passing and guard retention. And I was like, no, they're not. Like, I'm going to prove to John like during this camp that I'm going to pass anybody's guard. So I like really focused on guard passing for the ADCC camp. So over camp. what time period was the camp? How long? Uh, so it was like I think a twelve week camp. So it was uh, like three months before ADCC. Um, so it was like probably summertime when we started, and ADCC was September. Yeah, September. September yeah. yeah. So uh, it was uh, a decent amount of time ago. I was probably an average passer until brown or black belt, and I started getting a little bit above average, but nothing special. But I didn't really become like a good guard passer until before the ADCC camp. Good. Oh. And just to make sure I understood here, so there in your system of guard passing, the way you see guard passing, there are three points, right? One is losing passing, like Toriano, leg yeah. drag. Then there is the tight passing, like over under, double under, this and that, and submission passing. That's when you jump in a guillotine and try to go to yeah. the mount or yeah. jump in a kimura. Yeah. yeah, when you put so much pressure on them that they have to start extending limbs to push you away and then you go in for, whenever you get limb extension, there's submission danger. So it started to get them to push away from you and then you use submissions to get past okay. the legs, yeah. No, but I think that's a great way to learn jiu-jitsu because most of the times what you see jiu-jitsu instructors doing is like, guys, here's how to do the double under. Then next day, here's how to do the toriano. But they don't explain like how different one is to the other. Yeah, right? it's, it's just so. it's just a, it's just one technique. What you need yeah. what you need is multiple series of moves that all overlap with one another, so you can use them interchangeably to systematize everything. I got it. Yeah, and when I was watching you teaching today, I, I was paying a lot of attention that how you create a transition between the losing pass to the tight pass to the submission pass and that yeah. kind of thing, right? Yeah, they all interchange. You start putting pressure on people and you use one pass to, to chain with other passing. So if you lose loose passing and people start to extend their limbs away from you, there's submissions there. If they start to if they start to extend limbs away from you, there's underhooks there. If you use tight passing and they start to extend limbs to push you away, then you go into submissions. If you use submissions and as they go to bring their elbows back in because they don't want to get submitted, then you go in and you get chest to chest and you use your tight passing. So the whole thing uh, is how do I chain these three kinds of passing together? Uh, man, this is amazing. And I think think it's going to be one of the best instructors have ever done because every time I talk with people who does jiu-jitsu, sometimes in seminars, in the training, this and that, what people always struggle is the transitions, transitions, transition. How to transition from one position to the other, to this one, to the next one, with my opponent defending on this way, that way. So, and you broke down this like on every single detail. So that yeah. was... I'm trying to at least. There's so many different variables that could happen in guards because your partner can go from one guard to the other guard. They can invert. They can do all kinds of different reactions. But uh, I'm trying to get every possible reaction covered for you guys. So hopefully you like it. <laughs> I've, um, if I could speak a little bit from experience. So I'm someone who's on the older side. I'm 44. And my birthday is this month. So I'm almost at the end here. One but, day after my birthday. <laughs> <Yeah, my, laughs> but um, so I, I love jujitsu. I still try to train every single day, sometimes twice. But I can't go jumping around doing crazy things. And I've taken now, Gordon's taught me a couple times, and what I found is that it's just incredibly systematic. It's much more about understanding than it is about any sort of athleticism. I mean, Gordon's clearly a very strong guy, but it, the, the passes don't rely on that. I would say maybe it's with his, it means 10 or 20% strength, 80% knowledge, sequencing, and system, basically diagnosing exactly where you are. I mean, he's he taught me to understand where I am in the past at a much greater detail than anyone else has. That's what I found. I, so as, as an older guy, I thought this passing system was an absolutely incredible. Yeah, and I think a good example of that uh, is his his guard passing is a lot about technique and not about strength, is that the Yuki for the video was his girlfriend, right? Yeah, yeah, no. If it was all about strength, how could he use a girl to be the Yuki, right? Yeah. But uh, you can you can see, like, when he was doing on her, how it's all about the technique, it's all about the adjust, it's not about the strength at all, so. Yeah, and you have to remember, too, like, different kinds of guard passes work for better people. If you ask a 140-pound person to try to 
to try to smash past a 240 pound person and their equal skill level, even if the guy, the lighter guy, is much better. The chances of the big guy just being able to roll over and take him over are very, very high. Okay, but if you ask a smaller guy to be able to just loose pass someone who's much bigger and not as mobile, they can create movement and put pressure on them through movement of the feet. Okay, if you take a big guy on top and you ask him to try to hit Toriando passes on a guy who's 140 pounds, it's probably pretty unlikely. But instead, if you pin him down and hold him in place and tight pass him, it'll probably be a lot easier. And then submissions usually work on everybody, so you can use those pretty much on any body type. Cool. Now, Gordon, when you, I know you're a really student of the game. Who are some of the guys you watch to, to get better at passing? Um, so initially when I was coming up, it was Keenan a lot. Um, okay. when I was Because like, Keenan was, uh, was a black belt when I was a blue belt. So wow. like coming up from like blue belt and purple belt, I was like, oh, like here's like a lanky American guy who like, like it does like similar kind of passing I made a video with, with Keenan when he was a brown belt, so you're just making me feel even older. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, yeah, like I was like, oh, okay, like he was like an American guy who like yeah. has a similar style of guard passing. He's tall and lanky like me. Um, so he, I watched. He's, he's more of a loose passer, wouldn't you yeah, say? Yeah. With his leg dragging. Yeah. He's excellent. Yeah. So I, I watched him a lot coming up. But uh, the problem is like I would always try to do his passes and they would always put me in leg entanglements. So like a lot of his things, like they rely on him getting to outside position but they leave his legs exposed yeah so like i would try to do these passes to like gary and eddie and they would just leg lock me every time i'm like oh this stuff doesn't work um so then like <laughs> af after i like tried to like study a bunch of people and like all their stuff would just leave my legs exposed i just like started listening to whatever john told me to do and i just let him do this tape studying and i just listened to whatever he said so john studies most of the tape now and just tells us what to do <laughs> <laughs> knowing what i know that's probably a good idea <laughs> yeah right. i'm like why am i wasting my time here john's yeah. just gonna tell me this stuff eventually yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. And uh, I, I was amazed if John like about how much Jiu Jitsu he knows, you know. Uh, it's ridiculous. And, and he knows just about he just knows just as much about everything in life as he does about jujitsu. Yeah. He like starts talking about <laughs> a random subject and he tells you like the whole history on it and you're like, Are you serious? Like how do you know about this? <laughs> I'm finding myself trying not to talk about John more than I'm trying myself to talk about. I'm actually getting like specific bands in the house. Like you can only mention him 10 times a day. Like <laughs> since he's like come into my life, you know, he's, he's such a bright guy. And like, it's sort of like when you're with him, you remember like every bit of every story that he tells you. Yeah. 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 He tells him so perfectly. Yeah, he does. Like anything you start talking about, he'll just tell you like the full history on, yeah. like, on like, what it was. Like you'll talk, it's like you'll t start talking about this TV, and he'll give you like the full history on the company and who the <laughs> owner is, and it's just like how do you know all this stuff? Hundred percent. Yeah, but one thing that's amazing, uh, the fact that you were John's student is not only that you were winning everything, but uh, a bunch of guys in jiu-jitsu they are only fighters, right? And they don't know how to teach. And you were teaching exactly yeah. like John teaches. Uh, today, for example, I was hearing you say, and you were mentioning like dilemma all the time. Dilemma. Yeah, John yeah, mentions yeah. dilemma all yeah. the time. Like now you create a dilemma. The guy can do this or the guy can do that. So you're laying your back in a supine position. Like, yeah. 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 You guys are the only He teaches, a lot of it rubs off. Yeah. But he teaches us how to be dynamic problem solvers. Um, because for me, that's, that's the real way to gauge how good you are in jujitsu, is if you can translate to somebody else and make somebody else a champion. Okay. A lot of guys win just just based on a lot of physicality. Okay, you can just be relatively athletic, know a little bit of jujitsu, and just be more athletic than the other guys who know a little bit of jujitsu and win a lot of tournaments. But to be able to make someone else good in a short amount of time, especially children, is how I base someone on their knowledge of jujitsu. Like if you look at like what he did with Nikki, like Nikki's 17 and he's beating like black belt legends. Like yeah. you can't just do that because you're athletic and like gifted. Like you have to be good. <laughs> well, I agree. No, and I was telling John that it, what it's impressive what he has been doing because I think many times to build a jiu-jitsu champion jiu-jitsu team or or a school whatever. The most important thing is to create the environment, right? That you can have all those guys training together and that. But this doesn't mean that these students will play your game. Yes, of course. And what John has been doing, like, you guys play exactly his game, exactly what he yeah. teaches you guys. We're so. all... We're all students of, of a foundation of moves, but we all have our own personality to it. So all the core principles remain the same. It's just we have our own spice that we add to each of his moves. Yeah, yeah. So th this is very impressive, you know, because most of the great instructors that I know, they create the environment. And then the... the you put like 10 crazy tough guys together to train against each other. They all have different games. And yeah. they all get good, right? Because they're yeah. training. But what John has been doing for you guys, that's very, very impressive, is this. Like, you guys all play that type of yeah, game. Relatively the same. As you game. said, with uh, 
spicing up on your way and is that a yeah like we all have the so, same we all have some innovations that we do but we're all doing relatively the same thing yeah no i i agree and uh, the, this is like super super impressive yeah, i would say um a couple things of impressions so this is now like the second time we've got to spend some time together and after the first time you know you spend a few days like 15 hours a day with someone you get to know them pretty well and a couple things surprised me one so if you if you look at gordon's social media account it's by far the most entertaining. I mean, we could sit there and we could say, who's the best <laughs> Who's the best grappler on the planet? A lot of people are going to say Gordon. Some people aren't. I don't think that you could say who has the most entertaining social media account. Uh, I don't think there'd be a lot of debate, right? It's <laughs> clearly him. So like, but, but so after seeing that, there were two things that really surprised me. One was that in person, like you're with him every day, just a really nice, normal guy, like very easy to talk to, like not only talking about himself, he's, he's he lying. goes yeah. back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> he, he probably doesn't even want to say that, but yeah, he's not, he's not like constantly challenging people to fights out on the street. You know? it's, it's just a nice, normal guy. The, the second thing that really surprised me was the work ethic. Uh, we did this fitness video last time and I actually had to like say, guys, I mean, this is crazy here. We're in hour four. And he was doing sets of squats where he would do 315 for 20, immediately pull off 45, do 225 for 20, and then do 135 for 20. And he's banging out three of them. It's 180 reps. And he's doing this kind of like stuff for <laughs> like, I, I just could not believe the work ethic and just seeing him from, I don't know if he talks enough about that and the, between all the getting in fights with the people at Ruth Chris and that kind That's of stuff. That's because I don't want to have to remember it. Every <laughs> yeah. workout is like miserable. <laughs> but talk a little bit about what daily life is like. Uh, so it's pretty routine. Um, you know, we wake up. So like a, a Monday, for example, I'll wake up uh, at 545. I'll go to John's class, we'll eat breakfast, leave at my house at 630, get ready for John's class at 745. We'll drill, we'll train. That ends at 915 or so. Uh, then I'll eat food, shower, get done by 1030. Then I'll sleep on the mats from 1030 to 1230. Then uh, we'll do John's second class at 1230. And then we'll train. That usually brings us to about 2.15. Then uh, we'll take like 15 minutes of a break. Gary will spar MMA. And then I'll spar MMA. And then that brings us to around 4-ish, 4 4.30 sometimes after we're showered. Uh, and then depending on how I feel, I either go lift weights right away or I go home, take a nap, and then go lift weights after that. And then do it all again the next day. And so. you also mix in a bunch of privates. Yeah, teaching privates a lot. Um, I usually do like usually four to five privates a week. So oh. four to five hours of privates a week, and then uh, two to three, two to three sessions a day, including MMA plus a lifting session, like four to six times a week. So yeah, but I like it. Uh, one one thing I mentioned here that I like it is how efficient is your time, right? Because uh, while you were training or you were sleeping, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much <laughs> training, sleeping, training, training or eating. Or eating. <laughs> I'm either training, I'm sleeping, or not like trying to force food down my throat so I don't like lose weight and yeah. like be 185 yeah. pounds again. But man, a bunch of people don't do that. They, they train and then they hang out somewhere, talk with friends. Isn't oh that? yeah, there's almost none of that. It's pretty yeah, much you're... just exclusively eating or sleeping or training. And then th yeah. I think that's the way to... To, to be able to train harder and to get better every day. So. And also talking about Nat, like, is as tough of a coach as John is, I'd say he's probably your second toughest coach from what I've seen. Oh, like, it's terrible. Like, her in the weight room, she's an absolute tyrant. I mean, like, she takes, no, she orders him around, like, no more reps, and he does it. And, like, I mean, she, like, like I, would, I would not want to do one of her workouts. Like, it's really bad. Like, <laughs> like really bad. I'm, I'm literally on time to time, I'm like, can you, I'm like, just go kill yourself. She's like, well, the worst is when she tells me to do, like, a certain amount of reps, and I get there, and then she, like, tells me to do 10 more. And I'm just like, motherfucker. Mm. Like, he, just, he told me to do 20, now I got to do 30. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a 24 hours personal training. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, it, it works, but it's just like, oh my god, man, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. And then I'm like always happy after I do it, but like during it, I'm just like, oh, this is so miserable. Yeah, but man, this is another advantage you have against everybody because most of the people when they get in a relationship and they are training hard, isn't that? The girlfriend complains that oh, yeah, you're, yeah. you're never here, you don't give me time. She's the opposite. She's pushing. Yeah, <laughs> She's like making me train harder than I actually want to. Oh my god. god <laughs> so talk about the future a little bit. What what is it that you see? You've already done so much at 23. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm still 
competing without the gi. Um, right now, I'm mixing up gi training and MMA training. Um, still planning to compete in the gi, but I have to say I'm liking MMA a lot more than I'm liking gi training. I don't know what it is. It's just more interesting for me to be able to actually beat somebody up versus just roll around on the floor somewhere. Um, so I'm still going to compete in the gi. I'm going to compete in MMA, event, MMA eventually. Um, when I do decide to stop competing in the gi and compete in MMA, uh, I'll still do no, I'll still do no gi grappling. So whenever it is I decide to actually start fighting, I'm still going to compete in no gi grappling and MMA at the same time. I, I plan to be world class in jiu jitsu and MMA simultaneously. So we'll see how that goes. We're seeing more and more guys do that as grappling becomes more financially rewarding. But when we go and talk to you at 33, what what do you think your resume is going to look like? Um, so I think I'm going to be, uh, you know, world champion, um, multiple time world champion. Uh, I think I'm going to be ADCC, uh, definitely absolute champion and just multiple time super fight champion. Uh, and then hopefully, uh, an MMA champion of multiple weight classes of whatever organization I'm at, which, whichever that is when I'm 33. So okay. hopefully multiple times jiu-jitsu champion and, you know, multiple weight class MMA champion. Cool. Yeah, and man, the, this confidence is impressive. Yeah. This is like, and I respect it because you have done that. I, I told you another day, I'm not, not lying, like before you win the ADCC and this and that, I would see you saying like, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I was like, come on, this guy. And then after <laughs> after you did, I was like, now this guy has all my respect. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the, he two made of, it. <laughs> the, two, the two of us together, we watched a match in 2016. It was the EBI finals. <laughs> and like, and you looked really good in it. And then um, Bernardo and I looked day at each other, was like, the day that I started yeah, like I was I like man this, there's something coming there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think that that was there was this it was a, you pretty much took the guy down Kamora right to the back system and done. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 No, but what I think what happens many times, man, p- people talk, uh, a lot of people talk a lot yeah. of stuff. And most of the times, the people who talk a lot, they don't do yeah. what they talk. There's a lot but, of craziness. But like there are exceptions, right? like, yeah. one is that's here, well, that's the other issue. one is corner, yeah. Yeah. you know, like, so. That's the issue. If you talk a lot, but you don't actually do anything, or if you yeah. if you do compete and you just lose all the time, then everyone just thinks you're a clown. But yeah. that's why the people like me so much, because I actually I talk a bunch of shit, but I actually go in and actually beat people. Yeah. So that's why my yeah. fa- like I have the most loyal fans ever. Like, I actually go in and I beat people, and people love me. So um, I'm grateful that you guys all appreciate the things that I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but man, uh, so guys, we, we we just shot one entire structure with he, with Gordon today about guard passing. We might launch it probably in February or March, but we believe February. And uh, I think it's going to be the most complete instruction about guard passing we have ever done. It's going to be more than seven hours of video. We have never <clears throat> done any instruction about guard passing that is that, that amount of uh, content. So we're super excited for that. And uh, anything else, Michael? Any other question? or? No, I can say that I'm just so impressed by the guard passing system. I mean, Thank you. And, and just the results that I've had with it and how user-friendly it is. It's not something... Michael literally texts me like once a week. And he's like, I've been crushing people with this, with that long step you showed me. <laughs> he's, like, he's, like, he's like, just a simple detail of keeping your elbow yeah. high. He's like, changed my whole life. So I'm like, oh, great, man. That's how I'm serious like, I take the jiu <laughs> Yeah, but that's true. Like, Michael is the most addictive jiu-jitsu practitioner I ever saw in my life. I remember when I moved here to Boston. Boston, for example, uh, I was about to open the school, this and that. So the school was delayed to open. And my place to train jiu-jitsu was at Michael's house because he has a mat area in the basement. And in many days, this crazy guy would call me like 11.30 p.m. when he, his, his kids were on bed and he talked with his wife and that. Hey, you want to do some rolls? It was 11.30 p.m. I was like, no. But I never say no to him. So 10 minutes later, I was there in his house. Man, I got it. You have access to the best guys in the world. You want to use it. So I've, uh, I'm very, very happy with my job and, and what I do in this world. <laughs> no, but uh, guys, so that, that was our seventh episode with Gordon Ryan. We hope to do another 10 episodes with him, one of the guys we want to talk the most. And today we talk more about guard passing, that's the new structure that he's coming up and his plans. But we have a lot to talk with him. I think if we would talk with him everything we want, we would stay here for like 20 hours. So let's keep it for the next episode. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys.